very, very pleased to be invited here to be part of this wonderful evening. And I want to thank um, all of you, Marilyn Donnelly, uh, Dr. Fiore, all of your staff that have uh, uh, taken out your personal time to be with us tonight and to listen to us. And, and I hope that we'll have a lot of interaction at the end of this evening as well, because um, that's what I look forward to is the question and answer session. I will talk for a few minutes, and then I'll let the rest of the uh, team also talk to you, and then uh, we'll have a very hopefully energetic uh, question and answer afterwards. But I do want to say thank you to the Wellness Committee again for giving us this opportunity to be a part of your uh, community's uh, lecture series, and I'm very excited about the future and building um, our uh, working together uh, and taking care of our men and women with breast problems. So, and thank you for the men who are here tonight as well. I wanted to start by uh, giving us a little background about breast cancer. It was over 180,000 cases diagnosed um, of invasive cancer. It's probably about a quarter of a million new cases that are diagnosed every year. That makes up about a quarter of all cancers diagnosed in women. Men are also at risk for breast cancer. About 1,720 men will be diagnosed with breast cancer. And of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, most of them have no risk factors at all. The greatest risk is basically having the XX chromosome. The facts about developing breast cancer are our risks increase with our age. So as you can see on my slide here, age over 50 is the highest risk, 72% at that point. So your risks do increase. Having a first child after the age of 30 or having had no children also increases your risk for breast cancer. Um, starting your periods at an early age or um, late menopause. So basically prolonged exposure to hormones will increase your risk. Increased alcohol also increases your risk and obesity after menopause particularly is associated with increased risk for breast cancer. There's also a syndrome called hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. Some of you have maybe already familiar with this syndrome, but I wanted to mention it briefly and talk about some of the risk factors. So if you see anything on this list that you're worried about, then I'd be happy to talk to you in more detail about it after uh, our presentations as well. But breast cancer diagnosed less than 50 is a risk factor for this hereditary uh, syndrome. Multiple breast cancers, having had more, you know, more than one breast cancer yourself. Um, ovarian cancer in the family, having had a, a male in the family with breast cancer. Jewish heritage and three or more breast cancers in the family. And it doesn't matter whether it's the mother's side or the father's side of the family. So these are all risk factors for a hereditary predisposition for breast and ovarian cancer. Why this is important to mention is because in this particular population of people, their risk for getting breast cancer is significantly higher than the general population, about 87% by the time they're 70. And um, the risk of ovarian cancer also is very high, about 44% by age 70. In this particular population, not only can we screen with mammograms, but we can screen with MRIs, in particular in addition to doing self-exams and clinical breast exams every six months. Now I want to talk about prevention. Um, Self-breast exam, I think, is very still uh, an important part for men and women. Um, men can find lumps in their breasts. While cancer is not likely, um, it, it, there still can be other types of lumps. I had a gentleman last year, it turned out he had a different type of cancer, but he presented like a lump. Um, so, although cancer isn't uh, common, there are other reasons, too, that uh, even men can develop lumps, like gynecomastia, which can be on both sides of, or just on one side where you can de develop a lump. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a benign growth of breast tissue in males. It may be due to uh, medication. It may be due to testicular tumors. So if you ch check your testicles for lumps, that's very important as well. Maybe due to liver disease. So there are many things that men need to watch out for. I had a, a, a gentleman today in my office ask me why men aren't getting mammograms. Well, we really don't um, have a lot of breast tissue in, in men, so the most important thing I think is self-exam. Unless you are happen to be a man who has the hereditary predisposition, then of course I think we should talk about screening in those situations. But at the very least, I think self-exam for men is still very, a good way to pick up uh, these lumps. Um, so for women as well, I think oftentimes none of the tests we do for, for screening are going to be 100 percent. So I do think it's important to check uh, yourselves as well. Oftentimes you can find things that maybe your last mammogram didn't show anything, you know, and maybe something new has cropped up. Or perhaps maybe when the mammogram is taken, for example, <laughs> it may not get something way up here because it's so far lateral. 
you know, and you're squeezing and compression the breast like this in a sandwich position, or even when you're going side to side, sometimes you may not catch that very tail near the axilla or something. So there's oftentimes little tiny lumps that a woman may find and discover herself. It happens not infrequently. Um, similarly, other things that are important are if you have nipple discharge, um, particularly bloody nipple discharge, watery nipple discharge, or clear color discharge, maybe light straw colored discharge, that could be a warning for cancer. Although not, you know, um, necessarily that it means it's cancer, but it should be uh, made aware to your, you should tell your physician and get it checked. Um, skin changes. If you see like uh, changes in your nipple, crusting of the nipple, sometimes that's eczema, you know, a benign skin condition, but it could also be a, a form of cancer in the nipple that's only in the nipple. Sometimes it's also associated with a lump in the breast, but that could be an early sign of a, an early cancer called Paget's disease. Skin changes like indentation, retraction of the nipple or indentations. Um, pay attention when you notice differences in your breast. Just get familiar with how they appear and, and, and check yourself monthly. That's what I recommend. If you notice any changes, bring it to the attention of your doctor if you have concern that this is not normal for you. Mammography. There's been a lot of debate in the past year, I think, about uh, screening guidelines. The American Cancer Society guidelines are a baseline from 35 to 40. After uh, that, then 40 in every year is recommended for the average person without any risk factors. And then for women who are high risk, they should begin, if they have a family member who, let's say, got diagnosed with breast cancer at age 40, they may want to start their mammos at 30. So you go 10 years earlier than the uh, relatives cancer was diagnosed. MRI is another tool that's coming into more frequent use for a lot of different reasons. It's much more sensitive mammography, although I will say that mammography is the best way to detect cancer when it shows up as microcalcifications, which is often associated with an, the earliest stage or stage zero, DCIS. So mammography is really the best way to find those microcalcifications. But MRI does have its use and it's very sensitive um, for picking up small, tiny cancers, a few millimeters. Um, it can be used in conjunction with doing mammograms for screening or diagnostic workup if there's any a need for clarification when a patient has some uh, findings on their exam and they've had a mammogram, they've had an ultrasound, but there's still some quandary, an MRI can be very useful. For screening high-risk people, people who are gene carriers or even other people who just have a very strong family history, they have very dense breast tissue, then more frequently MRIs may be useful in that population as well. And then before a patient has surgery, I often want to get a breast MRI to help aid in planning for the operation and also helps assess the opposite breast. So it has a role in preoperative planning as well. I find that's very useful. It does not require any compression when it's done. The uh, patient will lay on their stomach um, so the breasts hang through the coils to do the MRI. It's also useful for evaluating people who have had breast reconstruction, looking for implant rupture, or implant leaks. Um, and again, it's very effective for imaging women who have uh, dense breast tissue. That could be young or old or in high-risk patients. So how do we diagnose somebody, you know, and figure out what's going on? Well, let me just briefly review some of the methods. A fine needle aspiration which some of you may be familiar with, is a very simple procedure. Basically, we feel a lump, we can numb up the skin, put a, just a regular needle in there and basically aspirate cells and that cellular material can then be analyzed um, by the pathologist and hopefully give us an answer about whether something is benign or malignant. Another procedure is called a core biopsy. And if we have a lump and we want to get a good piece of tissue from it, we can actually numb up the skin and often under ultrasound guidance in the office, put a needle in and take samples with actual tissue pieces coming out and have that analyzed by the pathologist so that we get a more thorough diagnosis and um, uh, test done on that type of specimen. That's very often what we use to make a diagnosis. Stereotactic biopsy is similar to a core biopsy, only this requires the aid of mammography. So in a patient who does not have a lump that you can feel, but perhaps it's something you only see on a mammogram, or it's a microcalcification, tiny nodules that you only see on a mammogram, then this is the way that we have to do the procedure. The patient will lay prone on their stomach on a stereotactic table, a special table. The breasts will hang through. We will then take pictures of the mammogram and find the target that we're after. And then with a computerized system, we can then uh, target our needle to the 
proper area to obtain the material in a similar fashion as I just described earlier. That will then get analyzed and we get results usually within 24 to 48 hours and then we can move forward in terms of what's next. Sometimes if we cannot make a diagnosis by any of those means I just mentioned, then a needle localization biopsy is necessary. That's basically where I work very closely with my radiologist at my hospital. They will actually uh, help target the area in question ahead of surgery by taking mammograms to find the area in question. They put a little wire into the location of the uh, area in question. Then the patient will come to surgery and at that point we'll make a small incision and basically excise the tissue in the area of concern and then that goes to the pathologist for a diagnosis. It's a very uh, a short operation and an outpatient procedure. So I wanted to kind of close this uh, uh, part of um, our evening by just going over some facts and fallacies of breast cancer. So true or false, do underwire bras cause breast cancer? A lot of people ask me that, but it's, it's false. Coffee causes breast cancer. So that's false too. So drink your coffee. It's all right. Antiperspirants or deodorants can cause breast cancer. True or false? No. Right. It's false. Oral contraceptives cause breast cancer. Generally speaking, oral contraceptives are safe, and I would not consider that such um, a bad uh, risk factor for breast cancer. How about this? Once you let the air in with a biopsy, it will spread. I still get asked that, not infrequently, and that's false also. That's largely a myth. Large-breasted women have a higher risk of cancer than smaller-breasted women. That's also false. Only women get breast cancer. You guys are paying attention. How about if you touch your breasts inappropriately, you will get breast cancer. Only women who have a family history get breast cancer. That's false. Older women are less likely to get breast cancer. Fibrocystic changes, lumpy, bumpy breasts are at an increased risk. I think very minimal, if any. So really, it's okay. You know, I wouldn't worry too much. But yes, I would say in the sense that if you feel a lump and you're known to have lumpy breasts, don't mistake it and say, oh, that's my cyst or that's my lump again. Anything that changes, get it checked out. Just be sure it's not possibly something else. Um, so a word of caution with that. Nipple discharge is a high risk of breast cancer. Depends what type. I think I covered that a little bit earlier, particularly the bloody, clear, uh, watery type we worry about and straw colored. A tender lump is a sign of breast cancer. Not necessarily, no. Breast cancer can be considered a risk from the mother's or father's side. 